Okay, welcome back to physical and chemical state of subducting slabs and the slab mantle interface. And we're gonna, we're, thank you for coming back after coffee. We're gonna launch right into our first talk, which is uh, by B. Dragovic, Baxter, and Kadic, with the title, Dehydration History of Subducted Lithology, Syphnos, Greece. Dessam Dragovic will give the talk. Thanks, Greg. I wanna thank everybody for, uh, um, coming here, I want to thank the conveners for putting this session together and, and for all who are coming back from their delicious coffee break. Um, as we're, we're all being made aware in this talk, and we all know anyways, that the dehydration reactions that are happening during subduction uh, directly influence many processes that we've been talking about, including magma genesis, seismicity, physical properties of the slab, and indeed later on the return of volatiles to the deep mantle. Um, since Ethan talked in his earlier talk, uh, um, we can relate garnet forming reactions uh, to the release of water. These hydrous parent phases that um, form garnet um, will release these uh, uh, vast amounts of water. And if we can figure out the timing and duration and rate of garnet growth, we can then relate this to uh, the timing, duration, and uh, uh, rate of water um, of devolatization. So where we do this, and again, Ethan mentioned this earlier, we do this in Syphnos, Greece, an exhumed session, uh, section of uh, Eocene age. Uh, it's, ter it's termed a cycladic blue schist unit, and, but in fact, it's, it's almost anything but blue schist in some cases. There's a variety of lithologies, mostly garnet bearing, um, anywhere from quartzofeldspathic gneisses that you can see in the bottom left to these jaded, jaded gneisses. Um, so what we've done is to take uh, this uh, field-based approach towards developing a dehydration fluxes by combining high precision geochronology and thermodynamic analysis in order to determine uh, what the fluxes of water are during metamorphism. Um, our ge our, this geochronology employs ge uh, work on both zoned garnets, as Ethan showed earlier, there's a five centimeter garnet from this quartzofeldpathic gneiss, but also bulk garnets where the garnets are too small. So what we'll develop here is a, a bulk volume age rather than this uh, zoned age, this uh, chronology shown earlier. And all the rocks were taken from the northern part of the unit, which is uh, f free of uh, green schist facies uh, retrogression. So just to quickly show some of the geochronologic steps, we show this t zone from that five centimeter quartzofeldspathic uh, garnet, where 10 discrete zones uh, were drilled out of the sample. And you can see the, the action of the core being drilled out. And shown earlier, but uh, here, shown again here, is this sample 6C, which is an example of a mafic blue schist in which three zones were uh, micro-drilled. And as described earlier, but I'll describe again, the micro-drilling and geochronologic techniques, including dissolution and column chemistry and uh, ID Tim's work, um, can be described in, in previous papers, um, one of which is Paulington and Baxter, 2011. So to the geochronology, we look at the large five centimeter zoned uh, quartzofeldspathic uh, garnet, and what we see here from the 10 discrete zones, nine of which were able to be recovered uh, due to matrix contamination on the 10th zone, but what we can see here is a very early initiation of garnet growth, followed by um, a majority of the garnet growth happening during a very short time span. Uh, and this is a radial plot of distance from the core with age. You can see these two outliers in age. Uh, these, it turned out these samples were prepared differently. Um, so we, uh, in, in addition to that, they do not seem to fit, they don't fit the ge geometric constraints for radial age growth. So uh, we can, we can um, exclude these for now. What I do here is we, I show you the radial uh, distance from the core with age, but if I can convert these to volumes to be for something that's a little more significant, what we see for that one sample is that over the first six million years of growth, we, f we form 0.2 volume percent garnet. And then over a very short time span, we form the majority of the garnet growth. And this corresponds to a two order of magnitude acceleration in garnet growth, where very early on we form garnet at this rate, one centimeter cubed per million years, and then for the rest, for the rest of the time we form it uh, very quickly, two order of magnitude acceleration. What we can do then is start putting together other uh, zone geochronolo geochronologic worth from other samples. Here's a sample 6C that Ethan showed earlier where garnet growth is happening during this very short time span on the order of hundreds of thousands of years. Another sample that we can put, uh, that we, we put on this where it shows a little longer garnet growth span but still quite, quite short, uh, certain, certainly for someone who's interested in garnet uh, growth durations. 
And then in addition, I noted, noted earlier that we have bulk samples in which the garnets are too small so we can tack those on and their ages and the amount of garnet that was formed in each of those ca cases. So what we can see here is still this early growth from one sample, but a majority of the garnet growth you know, in, this, in this unit is happening during a very short period of time, about two to three million years. So I put these, so what I can then put these onto a uh, plot of age, in, in this case versus nothing, essentially an age histogram plot, and I've added on a several other samples from bulk, uh, bulk rocks. But what you see here again is this early, early growth of the majority of the metamorphism happening in a short time span. And you can see the age precisions here. Without these high precision, without this high precision geochronology, we wouldn't be able to tease out such uh, short time scale processes. So what I do here is I can, I've, 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 what we're going to do here is, as I said earlier, is take, with the geochronology, we couple this with thermodynamic analysis. So what I'm going to do is take three of the samples shown here is this very large garnet, the mafic garnet, very early growth here, middle of the pulse shown here, and an intermediate rock of a very young age. And we're going to do uh, some thermodynamic analysis with these bulk composition in order to determine um, different properties of the rock during metamorphism. In our case for, thermo uh, for our thermodynamic analysis, uh, we've used Perplex. Um, we use the latest version of Perplex and providing a bulk composition, we're able to determine uh, the predicted values of modal abundance of garnet at different pressures and temperatures. But in addition, we can for, uh, predict uh, other properties of, rocks, of, of these rocks at different pressures and temperature conditions. One of these properties that we can predict at, uh, at, uh, using the, uh, these isochemical phase diagrams is uh, garnet modal abundance here shown on the left and weight percent water shown on the right. And what you can see, and as shown earlier from Ethan, is that we can make a direct link and an inverse correlation between the growth of garnet along a PT path and the release of water along that path. Uh, superimposed on top of both of these uh, um, isopleth plots is a pressure temperature path from Grappa et al. Um, from similar rocks on Sifnos. So this is their treatment for the pressure temperature path uh, or envelope on Sifnos. And you can see here is that quite a bit of garnet is being formed. Uh, um, early on, quite a bit of water is being released. We could do the same for another, this mafic lithology, 6C, is that water, the garnet's being formed a little earlier on, but then a majority of the garnet growth is happening along this heating path. And then again, a majority of the water is being released along this heating, uh, during this heating path. And then for this larger sample, we have here is that we see something a little different from the rest of the samples that we see, uh, that we see in which garnet growth the 52 and a half million years you saw earlier is happening very early on during burial. And a lot of garnet should be grown very early along the PT path, and very little should be grown late. As a result, a lot of water should be grown, uh, should be released uh, very early and not very much very late. But again, we did not see that in, uh, when, we saw the, when we looked at the chronology from that very large sample, we saw a majority of garnet growth happening very late. This is to suggest that there may be some type of kinetic component that delays uh, garnet growth and thus dehydration in, uh, in, in at least this sample. Um, so what I do here is uh, in order to couple the geochronology with the thermal analysis, so taking the ages, taking the garnet modal abundances that are predicted and those that we see and relate those to uh, weight percent water that can be released over time as I take a cumulative weight percent water um, over time. And we put that big garnet uh, 1A on top of it and we notice that early on not very much water is being released. With a little bit, 0.15 weight percent water released at around 47 million years, but then this explosion of water, up to 0.6 weight percent water released within the span of hundreds of thousands of years, um, around 46 to 45 million years. And we could do this again for some of the other lithologies, the mafic blue schist forming about 0.5, 0.6 weight percent water within the span of hundreds of thousands of years at roughly the same time. This other sample forming, in this case, 1.2 weight percent garnet within a span of a little over a million years. And then we tack on some of the bulk garnet uh, ages onto this, onto this diagram. And what you do notice still, and the, 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 story, the story is relatable to all these lithologies, is that very early on, very little metamorphism is happening. And then there's this relative pulse of metamorphism. So to wrap up some of the, to wrap up the work that I've described here, 
um, is that uh, we can take timing duration and rate of uh, garnet growth and we can link this directly to that of water release. And we could do this for a variety of the lithologies uh, shown here. They're all garnet forming. Uh, for individual garnet growth, uh, growth zone garnets, we can, the garnet related dehydration occurs during a very short pulse. This is on the order of hundreds of thousands of years and this is seen uh, in all of those lithologies. Uh, and for all of these lithologies, as, as I just said, the garnet related dehydration is focused in between this very discrete time span between 46 and a half and 43.3 million years. And this, as shown earlier in the, in the phase diagrams, this focused dehydration seems to have occurred during near isobaric heating to, uh, and this is using the PT path from, uh, from, um, from Grappo, to, to 2.0 to 2.2 gigapascal, so roughly 70 kilometers, and between 470 and 560 degrees. So I feel as a geologist at some point I have to show a, uh, an actual map, uh, a photo of my field site, but uh, um, I'd like to thank these people and these entities and uh, all of you for, uh, for coming. Thanks. Thank you, Besom. We have time for a few questions. Uh, as with the previous talks, if you have a question, uh, please come and use the uh, microphone. I guess. Uh, no, go, ahead. Yeah. go ahead. So I'll ask a question. Um, so I'm just wondering, these things not only were very short, the duration of garnet growth, but they're also at the same time. And I'm wondering, I mean, it's tempting to think of this as part of a steady state process that subduction zones under occur, but is there some event that happened that perhaps related to exhumation at that time that might account for this? Well, it, uh, so relating to, so re relating to the dehydration, to the event of dehydration, um, it's, it, it's perhaps the case that we get down to the, to, and this relates to a lot of the talks that we've seen earlier, but get down to a certain depth at which uh, these rocks will meet much hotter, uh, much hotter mantle at, this is roughly around 70 kilometers or 80 kilometers. Um, perhaps that it's a, in, in the case of the very large sample, is a kinetic effect so that the dehydration of some of the other, uh, some of the other lithologies or the dehydration of uh, underlying mantle is causing a catalytic effect uh, in this, whereas normal there'd be reaction overstepping uh, for a long time and in this introduction of water from other areas can cause this catalytic effect for metamorphism. Um, or it could be very well just, uh, just as I, as I said earlier, that this, this at, at that time and at that depth, it is being injected by this hot, this hot, hot temperature signature. So, yeah. Okay, I had a quick question for you, Besom. What's the range of uh, AL203 that you're uh, assuming in these calculations? I'm curious because in, in many cases, in say Circum Pacific suites, subduction suites, the, the metasediments are essentially gray wacky kind of compositions, They're not particularly luminous. These are, so these are, as I noted earlier, these are a variety of uh, lithologies and we're using, uh, we're using um, analyzed bulk chemistries and these have a, these have a wide variety of uh, aluminum ranges but they, um, many of the rocks that we have are not metapolitic in their composition but they're in fact uh, metabasaltic uh, or in this case metacidic as in the very large garnet. Um, off the top of my head, I couldn't give you very good uh, aluminous, uh, aluminum concentrations, but, uh, but just to, to say that they are wide in range. And, uh, so, thanks. Okay, thank you. All right, our next uh, talk is by Sarah Peniston Dorlin with co authors Bebout, Sorensen, Piccoli, and Walker. And the title of the talk is Reaction Rhine Formation and Melange in the Catalanaceous California. Sarah? Thank you, Gray. So we've heard a little bit about melange zones today, so I'm going to um, describe some uh, um, observations that we've made from melange zones. 
Um, melange zones are uh, regions that range in size up to kilometer scale um, and they're found within subduction zone metamorphic complexes. They consist of large scale blocks and you can see one of these blocks here in the field photograph in the very center dominating the, the picture um, surrounded by a much finer grained matrix and you can see the fine grained matrix is this grayish material that seems to be enveloping the block. Um, these melange zones are interpreted to represent the interface between the downgoing subducting slab and the overlying mantle wedge. So you can see here a couple of um, diagrams from the literature over the past 30 years representing um, schematically where these melange zones are located and some of the processes that are thought to occur within these melange zones. Um, they do occur worldwide and um, their position between the downgoing subducting slab and the overlying mantle wedge um, make them a, a natural lab to investigate um, the subduction zone processes that occur at this interface to try to understand processes of infiltration of fluids derived um, from dehydration of the subducting slab and also tectonic mixing processes of the downgoing crust with the overlying mantle. So I'm going to be talking about the melange zone of the Catalina Schist. It's located on Santa Catalina Island off the coast of Southern California. You can see here a geologic map showing the range of metamorphic facies exposed within the Catalina Schist. And there's a accompanying pressure temperature diagram on the left. I'm going to be focusing for this talk on rocks from the highest metamorphic grade, the amphibolite facies, which is represented by the red star on both uh, the map and the PT diagram. But I'll make some um, uh, observations at lower grade, the lawsonite albite facies, which is represented by the blue star on both diagrams. So here's a field photograph from that high-grade amphibolite facies melange zone. And as I mentioned, we have um, these mafic blocks surrounded by a finer grain melange matrix. In the high-grade uh, zone and Catalina, it's dominated by mafic lithologies um, as the block in the foreground and ultra-mafic lithologies. And uh, my collaborator and co-convener Gray Bebout has documented uh, the chemical composition of the melange matrix. And its chemical composition um, do documents the processes that are responsible for its formation. And so by looking at immobile elements such as chromium and aluminum, he's documented that um, there's an extensive physical mixing process of material derived from the ultramafic blocks and the mafic blocks that are uh, responsible, uh, that create the uh, concentrations of immobile elements observed in the uh, melange matrix. And then looking at more fluid mobile elements and isotopes uh, such as oxygen and boron, um, he's documented extensive fluid infiltration creating the um, isotopic signals of these uh, more fluid mobile elements. We've also started looking um, at reaction rinds um, between these blocks and the surrounding melange matrix. Um, and we can see evidence for similar processes. Here's one of these um, reaction zones on the edge surrounding um, a mafic block core. And we've done a lot of work just comparing um, the block cores to the rinds to try to understand the, the processes. And we again see um, evidence for mass transfer by infiltrating fluids and physical mixing. So when we look at fluid mobile elements, this is a paper that came out this year in, in Geochemica, um, looking at lithium, lithium concentrations on the X and, and isotopic composition on the Y axis, you can see the open symbols are the core con uh, compositions um, and the closed symbols are the rinds. And we have uh, very different compositions in the rinds compared to the cores and they can't be explained by mixing with an ultramafic source, so that requires an externally derived fluid to uh, create that signal. Looking at the more uh, immobile elements, we've uh, done a study looking at highly siderophile elements. This paper's just been accepted in EPSL. Um, looking at, um, in particular, I'll draw your attention to osmium, iridium, and ruthenium on this diagram. These are concentrations normalized to primitive upper mantle. And again, the open symbols are block cores. Um, the gray field, background field here, shows the composition of peridotite. And in this case, the uh, compositions of the rinds, which are the black symbols, do fall in between the ultra-mafic uh, peridotite and the black cores. And this suggests that um, mechanical mixing is responsible for, these relative, uh, for the concentrations of these relatively immobile elements. And indeed, the um, concentrations of osmium, iridium, and ruthenium are nicely consistent with predicting the percentage of uh, mixing of those uh, different um, components. Components. So we've done these studies, but what we'd really like to do is, is um, look at these things in detail so, um, and answer questions like which elements are affected by these two processes and can we try to establish a sequence of event, events to try to understand what's going on within these melange zones. So we're starting this work. This is just our, our, our sort of our first uh, set of results where we're, we're analyzing a traverse across this block rind into the block core. So I'm going to share sort of our first set of results from that. 
So we start by looking at the mineralogy. Um, you can see here thin sections across the bottom of the slide. This is not the entire traverse, but a thin section from the block core on the left, from the rind on the right, and in the middle we have a thin section that captures the contact, which I've highlighted with a dashed line. These pie charts are point counting results that, that represent the mineralogy, and I'll draw your attention to some of the main differences. In the block cores we have abundant garnets, which is the red slice of the pie. You can see them in the thin section scan. They're these large pale colored crystals. Um, the block rind has a few resorbed garnets, not many, and I'll, I'll talk about those in a minute. Um, another mineralogical difference in the rind, we have more hydrous um, phases. We have a, a chlorite, which is the uh, dark green wedge, and we have a lot of fengite, which is a magnesium silica rich muscovite, which is the yellow um, wedge. And then there's also a lot of quartz, which is the gray um, part of the pie. Looking at textures to try to understand the, um, how these reaction rinds form, uh, we can see that the rinds are foliated. Um, the amphibole crystals here are aligned roughly parallel to the, the pen knife. This suggests that there's a dynamic um, uh, environment for at least part of the history of the rind formation. Looking at thin section textures to try to understand what's um, happening with the rinds, we can focus on these rind garnets. And I mentioned that there are a few of them. They're rather small. You can see one of them in this plain polarized light photomicrograph in the left, and it's resorbed, and it's being altered to hydrous phases. So this suggests fluids are interacting um, and resorbing this garnet. So it's being uh, reacted to chlorite and fengite. And just to note that fengite is the major potassium and barium host. I'll return to that a little bit later. And lithium is hosted in both, um, both chloride and Fengite. The bottom right, we can see the garnets um, gone away entirely, and it's being replaced by chloride and fengite. The randomly oriented textures of these hydrous minerals within these um, pseudomorphs and replacement textures suggest that this replacement and this fluid um, alteration of the garnets uh, has taken place in a more static environment. Um, we also see this kind of texture with amphiboles. We have a fairly large, elongate, greenish amphibole crystal here, and it's got uh, fengite grains growing around the edges. Again, randomly oriented textures suggesting a static environment. So we've also collected um, bulk rock geochemistry uh, moving across the rind into the core. Um, the traverses are shown, results are shown here for a couple of elements that are thought to be relatively immobile from the um, block rind into the core. So I show chromium and nickel. And what I want you to take away from this just is a first order observation that we have elevated concentrations of both chromium and nickel in the rinds relative to the cores. And again, this is consistent with the, the results we got from the highly siderophile elements, that these uh, concentration of these elements is likely controlled by mixing. So I have a, a diagram here of nickel versus chromium. The uh, rinds are the blue symbols, and they fall on a mixing line between the block cores, which are the green symbols, and the melange matrix, which are the uh, gray triangles. So this suggests that we have physical mixing controlling the concentrations of these elements. What we want to find out, though, is to try to understand the sequence of events. Can we try to figure out when the mixing occurred? And w we can do this in, in sort of a uh, sequential kind of um, uh, situation where we try to consider whether the mixing happened before the garnet screw or after the garnet screw. So in order to do that, we, um, we kind of had this thought process, whereas if the mixing happened um, after the garnet screw, then the garnets in the uh, core and rind, or at least the centers of these garnets, should have the same chemical composition. If, on the other hand, there was mixing first, we changed the chemical composition of the rind, and then the garnets grow, we would likely have different garnet com uh, compositions in the rind and the core. So to make sure that our garnets are preserving their growth history, we've created x-ray maps. You can see here on the left um, a manganese x-ray map, and on the right a calcium x-ray map for the same garnet. We do have nice growth zoning. We have nice euhedral um, shapes preserved in these um, x-ray maps. Um, so that's our first step. The garnet zoning does appear to reflect uh, garnet growth. We can contrast these with the x-ray maps from the rind garnets. Yes, these two little tiny pictures down here are our x-ray maps for these rind garnets. They're to scale, so you can see how much smaller than the uh, core block core garnets they are. They are um, relatively homogeneous. There is no zoning in these, but we might expect, if we analyze the center of a garnet, um, uh, except for these little halos, these late stage reaction halos around inclusions, we would have a relatively uniform um, composition. And so we are indeed looking at the, the centers of these crystals. Here's a plain polarized light image superimposed on it. And we can see I've outlined with the yellow the chlorat chloratization surrounding that garnet. So when we compare the chemical compositions, I'm going to focus on, on calcium here, we see that the range of concentrations in the block core garnet for calcium, weight percent calcium oxide, range from 6.7 up to 12 weight percent calcium. The concentration of calcium in the rind garnet is 
nowhere in that range. It's much lower, 5.3 to 5.9 weight percent. So this suggests that we actually have um, this mechanical mixing process likely happened before these garnets grew. So we can do an even more careful analysis, avoiding inclusions and so forth, and just measure the very centers of the block core garnets here in green and the uh, rind garnets versus distance. And we can compare that to the bulk rock calcium content. And you can see that it reflects the bulk rock concentration pretty nicely. And if we look at a mixing uh, curve for calcium versus chromium, we can see that the rind compositions, again, the blue, fall between the cores, which are green, and the melange matrix. So, um, we'd like to suggest that this, this um, tells us that this mixing process did occur before the garnets grew. So you might be wondering what exactly this process is that we envision. Um, we had the fortune to, to drill across a contact at this low-grade lost night albite facies. So you can see the drill core from this, um, this uh, drill. And on the left is the mathic block. It's this sort of pale green color. You can ignore the Sharpie black markings on there. The matrix is the dark gray. And there's a, a little vein here on the end. But what I want you to see is the fact that right at the contact there, we have little broken off pieces of mathic block, these little pale green material. And the melange matrix is kind of worming its way in between these different little pieces of the mathic block. And we envision this as a low-grade analog for this mechanical rind formation. We essentially have little pieces of the mathic block breaking off, becoming smaller, and mixing physically with that matrix. And so as the block is going down to the sub subduction zone, we have these pieces breaking up, getting mixed together, and then eventually the, we get recrystallization that creates these rinds. Okay, so that's the story based on the immobile elements. When we um, consider what's happening with the more fluid mobile elements, we can look at um, the concentrations of potassium and barium and lithium, and you can see that they tell a different story from the immobile elements. They um, all f do not fall on mixing lines, so we have um, some, you know, this requires an externally derived fluid source with, um, that has concentrations of these elements. We're adding them to the rinds. And the petrographic evidence that I showed you earlier with the fengite and the chlorite, those are the main hosts for potassium, barium, and lithium, replacing the garnets and the amphiboles in the rinds, suggests that this um, addition of potassium, barium, and lithium is a late fluid, uh, due to a fl late fluid rock interaction. So I'm going to leave you with um, our sort of um, mental picture of what the processes are that are occurring within this melange zone to create these reaction rinds. I have sort of steps one, two, three, and four, and they're schematically shown on this cross-section of a, a subduction zone, uh, one, two, three, and four. So we can start off at relatively low grade where we have these blocks. Um, which are shown in the blue, and the pieces of the mafic blocks are breaking off, um, and so we have little bits of them, and they're mixing in with the melange matrix, which are the little uh, black squiggly bits in the uh, melange material. We can start to develop a foliation. We have a shearing environment with the, the downgoing subducting slab, so we can get this um, dynamic uh, foliation that we observe. As we go down into the subduction zone then, we can start growing garnets. And even when we look at the reaction, um, the reaction um, retrograde uh, chloride replacement of garnets and so forth, the garnets, um, their former size is not as big as those in the block core. So that tells us that maybe the garnets in the block core started growing before the rind garnets. And this could happen if we have a different chemical composition. So I've got the garnets here growing in these block cores early on. Um, so we've got going deeper, growing some garnets, and then continuing deeper, and we'll start to grow some garnets in the rind. Now they're growing in a different chemical composition, so the garnets will, um, are reflecting that uh, different chemical composition. And then we later on, um, uh, in step four here, we have fluid infiltration, indicated by these sort of pale yellow squiggly arrows. These fluids are moving through the melange matrix and interacting with this um, per, perhaps more permeable um, material in these rinds and altering the rinds, altering the garnets. And this is likely taking place in a more static environment. We see the, the um, static textures of the chlorites and the fengites, and probably at a lower temperature because we have this resorption of garnets. So we're, we're putting this perhaps on the um, upward path um, of the blocks. So thanks for your attention, and I'll take any questions. Okay, we do indeed have time for a few questions. Again, please come up to the microphone if you, if you have one. It's a long walk up here. It is. <laughs> Probably shout from the back. Going once. 
twice. Okay, our next uh, talk is by uh, Kian Wilson, uh, Spiegelman, Van Kecken, Fremode, and Hacker. And the title is Modeling the Migration of Fluids in Subduction Zones. Okay, so thank you very much for the opportunity to talk today. I'm going to be talking about something uh, really completely uh, different to what we've been hearing so far in this session. Uh, the development of a numerical model for the migration of fluids in subduction zones. So to try to motivate this, why are we interested in subduction zones and uh, more generally, I guess, in plate boundaries? Well, they control the large-scale mantle dynamics to the localization of uh, weak zones. They're obviously critical in the uh, global geochemical cycling. And they're also the locus of seismic and volcanic activity. Um, on top of this, in recent years, they've been the focus of uh, a lot of regional observational studies. And we really want to develop a new modeling framework uh, that allows us not only to extend our understanding of the physics uh, going on in subduction zones, but also, uh, obviously, ultimately, to help us interpret these observational studies a little better. Now, the challenge here is really that this is a multi-physics problem. It consists of a tightly coupled system of nonlinear equations involving coupled fluid and solid mechanics, uh, complex solid rheologies, and then also the coupling of thermodynamics and geodynamics. And to top all this off, there's a considerable uncertainty in both the equations and the constitutive relations that we uh, want to use. And for this reason, any modeling framework really has to be capable of being ex extended easily and being modified quite easily. But on top of that, we need to have uh, some confidence in the results we're getting, so it needs to be thoroughly benchmarked and tested. So building up a model from a, a simple base, we're using a kinematic uh, model of a subduction zone where the subducting slab velocity is prescribed. And this really drives the, uh, the solid flow within the, within the mantle wedge. Um, the kinematic model really allows us to keep a, a tight constraint on, our, our, on the, our geometry. And in turn, this allows us to actually incorporate into our unstructured mesh a sort of sub-mesh of the slab itself, of the downgoing slab itself, on which we can parameterize phase diagrams for the release of water and release of fluid into the, uh, into the mantle wedge. Now, I, uh, I apologize for showing equations, uh, but it's not really necessary to understand uh, every term in here. But what I wanted to emphasize was that we are solving a system of equations, these two here, for the solid velocity, for the solid flow, and the dynamic pressure. And these equations look very much like the standard Stokes equations that uh, are solved in many geodynamics codes already. But we are supplementing those equations with two extra equations for the pore pressure uh, and the porosity, the evolution of the porosity. We then additionally need to provide uh, some constitutive relations giving the uh, shear viscosity and the bulk viscosity, which is related to the shear viscosity, and then the permeability, which is related to the porosity. Now, the important thing to note here is that this is really a nonlinear coupled system of equations. So the, for instance, the shear viscosity, which is obviously cropping up within the solid flow calculation, is also coupled through the bulk viscosity back into our continuity equation and the, and the pore pressure equation and the porosity equation. In addition, the pore pressure is feeding information between the porosity evolution and the uh, pore pressure itself. So this is a, a system of, uh, at the moment, four equations, but it can become five once you start considering energy and temperature. Um, and they're very much not only coupled together. So we would like to be able to uh, write a model that we can easily extend, include, and take out equations. Um, and we also want to make this as easy as possible for ourselves. So we're trying to leverage as many of the open source numerical libraries uh, that are available to us. So the, fir the first one we're, we're using at the moment is uh, the Phoenix library, which allows us to provide very simple descriptions of the uh, complex equations that I showed you on the previous slide. 
and automatically generate uh, our model code from, the, from those descriptions. Uh, we're also using Petsy. Uh, in particular, we're using Petsy for its nonlinear solvers to try to converge out some of those nonlinearities I was describing on the previous slide. And finally, we want this system to be usable on some level, so we're, we're harnessing a, a, a user options interface called SPUD. Um, to give you an example of what I mean by uh, easily, easily describing equations, the, if we just look at incompressible solid flow, so we're just looking for the uh, solid velocity and the dynamic uh, pressure here, if we want to describe that in the Phoenix library, it requires just five lines of code. And this is also easily extensible, so we can add equations to it. And for instance, if we were to add uh, an energy equation to solve for the temperature to this set of equations, then we arrive at the set of equations that was used in the, uh, the um, subduction, kinematic subduction zone benchmark, uh, which provides a, a, a set of answers for various rheologies for us to compare and test and benchmark our code against. And what you're looking at here is the temperature field uh, for, the, for a temperature-dependent rheology uh, in a kinematic subduction zone. But more generally, if we uh, consider different rheologies, so an isoviscous, a temperature-dependent, and a strain rate-dependent rheology, what we see is that with increasing resolution to the left of each of these graphs, our numerical solutions, the stars, are converging towards the uh, benchmark solution on the dashed line. If we now return to the, the full set of equations, so we were just solving there for the solid flow and the temperature field, if we return to the full set of equations where we again introduce this, uh, these fluid flow equations that we saw earlier, um, and we observe that if we uh, ignore terms that are scaled by the small parameter, the background porosity phi naught, then, oh, I'm sorry, jumped too far there, our solid flow actually becomes the same incompressible solid flow that we solved in the subduction benchmarks. And one of, the, one of the coupling terms that we had previously between these two systems drops out. And what this allows us to do is to contemplate this system as a one-way coupled model. And what that means is we can solve for the solid flow as the first step, and then for the fluid flow as the second later step. So we can take solutions like those benchmarks that I showed you, and then add fluids on top of those flow fields. The important thing to note, however, is that even though one coupling term has, has been removed from these equations, we still have a coupling between the solid flow and the fluid flow, in particular through the shear viscosity feeding into the bulk viscosity law here. Now, if we do those steps and actually solve for the solid flow, so what you can see here is some temperature contours showing the overriding plate and where the subducting slab lies. And in the background, you can see the evolution of the, um, the fluid por portion of this problem, so in particular the porosity here, um, below 50 kilometers depth. And you can see that in the slab, or hopefully you can see in the slab, that we have two points of, two points of fluid source from our parameterized, uh, our parameterized phase diagrams. One, a shallow source, which is immediately emitted once the slab comes in, is fully coupled with the mantle wedge. Uh, and that's coming from the, uh, the upper slab. And then a deeper source coming from the lower slab and upper mantle, uh, which obviously comes out at a, at a greater depth. And in the first few time frames of this simulation, what you can see is that the uh, fluid from the deeper source initially runs up the slab in a slab parallel direction. And this is because it is following established fluid pathways, which result from increased uh, porosity and in turn increased permeability up the slab. Later on in the simulation, that, uh, th that fluid is able to escape the slab and travel across the mantle wedge. And you can see that in the isoviscous case, this, the fluid is traveling across the mantle wedge as discrete waves of uh, porosity. In the variable viscosity case, so in this case we're considering a temperature dependent uh, viscosity, what we see is that we have the same two sources of fluid but that the actual uh, pattern of distribution across the mantle wedge is quite different, and you can see that particularly here. We see that the uh, fluid travels across the mantle wedge in a much more dispersed wave, and also once it starts to interact with the higher viscosity uh, overriding plate, it tends to get trapped in the, in the uh, mantle wedge corner. 
Um, another key difference between the, uh, between the two simulations, between the isoviscous on the left and the uh, variable viscosity on the right, is that the compaction pressure varies by uh, actually an order of magnitude, although the scale is saturated, uh, an order of magnitude between the two. So this is the, this is the pore pressure being experienced in the slab. And this really informs us as to what, what we want to look at next, which is really examining some improved rheological models which will include some response to this over, potential overpressure in the pores, um, and perhaps through a sort of damage-based damage rheology. And then we also want to be able to consider the dynamic pressure contribution to the pore pressure, which we have excluded from these simulations. And then we can start considering recoupling the two sets of equations, the solid and the fluid equations again, uh, by considering reintroducing those small porosity terms that I dropped earlier, and then also there will be a coupling through th from the porosity into the solid rheology uh, with uh, some sort of porosity dependent uh, viscosity. And finally, we want to uh, obviously be able to, at, the, at this stage we're just looking at the fluid pathways from a single release of the fluid from the slab. We want to be able to incorporate uh, melting and rehydration into these, into these simulations. And my, uh, my main conclusions uh, from this really are that the fluid flow calculations really require an initially simple uh, model description, but one that's embedded in a modeling framework that allows us to gradually add physical complexity to the, to the system that we're solving for. Um, but to have any confidence in what we're, what we're doing, we really require a rigorously benchmarked uh, model. And uh, finally, uh, on the sub or physics side of things, the rheological coupling between the solid and the fluid uh, through the pore pressure can dramatically uh, alter the flow patterns and should not be excluded uh, from calculations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kian. We have time for questions. Yes. Uh, could you please come up to the microphone so we can... Okay, speak loudly. All right. Uh, well, that's really one of the uh, questions we want to answer uh, through this model, and we haven't run the simulations yet with the, uh, with, without the small porosity approximation. Uh, so that's really going to be the next step, and that's really what this modeling framework allows us to do to investigate questions like that. Still have time for one or two questions. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Our next and uh, last talk of the oral session, remember we have posters this afternoon, we hope you'll come to, is by Gao and Shen. And the title is Developing a Comprehensive Seismic Velocity Model of the Cascadia Subduction Zone. So let's get you set up. Thank you for the introduction. So in this talk, I will present some seismic results uh, in the Cascadia subduction zone resolved with the four-wave tomography. Uh, this is a work uh, as a postdoc in UR Rhode Island with Professor Yang Shen. So with the 3D velocity model, we hope to address two scientific problems. The first one is, um, in the Pacific Northwest, uh, many studies show the along strike segmentation. For example, uh, the accretion rewedge is segmented, and also the volcanic arc, the subducting slab, and also the metal wedge at the back arc. So we want to see the seismic segmentation from the velocity model. Uh, the second problem we want to solve is, uh, to explore the relationships of the segmented features and their implications. In this study, I will mainly focus on the 
relationship of the episodic tremor at slow sleep events with the seismic features and the implication to uh, hydration and dehydration in the crust and the mantle and also the melt transport. Another motivation to do this research is uh, from the model validation. Um, in recent years, there have been many uh, shear wave velocity models in the Pacific Northwest, but their accuracies haven't been tested. Uh, in the work we just uh, submitted last week, um, I compared four uh, models, uh, including the global crust 2.0 and the three regional shear wave velocity models. Um, in this figure, I showed you the relationship uh, of the um, phase delay times between the observation and the synthetic waveforms uh, in terms of the interstation distance. What you can see for the first and the last model, there is a linear trend of the phase delay in terms of the station distance. Um, this indicates the model is either too fast or too slow for the real Earth structure. Uh, even though there is no obvious linear trend for the second and the third model, the uh, phase delay still appears scattered. So from the model validation, um, it suggests that there is still space to update the velocity model in the Pacific Northwest. Um, in this study, I use a four-wave tomography method. This method accounts for the um, wave propagation within the 3D Earth structure, and it solves the nonlinear problem by uh, iteratively gradating, uh, upgrading the model. This method also considers both VPVS effects on surface waves. Um, and it provides an accurate way to integrate body and surface wave constraints. First, I want to introduce the quality of the data. On the left, I showed you the station distribution used in this study. Data is requested from 95 to uh, early 2011. So we have more than 15 years data. Um, on the right, I showed one example of the uh, empirical green functions filtered at 50 to 100 seconds. Um, the data is assorted in terms of the station distance. You can see the signal is really beautiful here. Uh, in this study, we can extract ambient noise up to 200 seconds. So there is, uh, in the wave simulation, um, I chose the regional shear wave velocity model by Gao et al. at 2011 as the starting model. Uh, each uh, station is considered as the virtual virtu source, and we simulate the wave propagation to all the other stations. Um, So uh, on the right, what I show it. I just click it. <laughs> so on the right, I just show you the ground motion response to where we to source um, uh, in, as an example. So once we have the observed at a synthetic waveform, we compared uh, these two waveforms at uh, different frequency bands. Uh, a simple example, um, the black is uh, uh, observed, synthet observed data and the red is a synthetic data uh, at different frequency bands. In this example, you can see uh, at 50 to 100 seconds, the synthetic arrives um, earlier than the observed. This may uh, indicate on average the reference model is faster than the real Earth. Uh, on the right, at 25 to 50 seconds, the phase arrival matches with each other quite well. So we do uh, 
the cross correlation at different frequency band to extract the phase uh, delay times between observation and uh, uh, synthetic data. This is a this is a figure to show the uh, model update after two iteration. What you are looking at here is x axis is the interstation distance. Y axis is the phase delays between the observed and the synthetics. The, the black dots are the measurement from the initial reference model, and the red dots are measurement after uh, two iterations. You can see the linear trend of the phase delays on interstation distance is um, decreased or corrected after the model update. This uh, suggests the improvement of the model after iteration. So how is my model compared to others? Here, um, compared to other three um, models that you can download from the IRIS web website. Um, this is the velocity uh, heterogeneity within 5%. Um, we can see uh, all these four models, the large scale structure, uh, there is a big similarity, but uh, in our study, the velocity hydro heterogeneity appear much larger than other models. This may be because of the um, calculation of the kernel, and we also we do uh, multiple iterations, so we recovered the velocity anomaly uh, well. Just to remind you uh, the scientific problems I'm interested to address in this study. The first one is if we observe the seismic segmentation in the Pacific Northwest. The second one is what are the, the relationship of uh, episodic tremor at slow sleep event to seismic structures and some implications. First, we'll see if the upper plate is segmented. In this method, I, will, I am able to resolve uh, P wave velocity at very shallow depths. Um, on the top, I showed you three layer crustal velocities. Um, at the bottom is the shear wave velocity model. Uh, what you, uh, the green dotted outline is the accreted oceanic crust uh, from Wells um, uh, it, uh, paper. Uh, you can see especially at 15 kilometer, if you um, see a long strike from north to south, see the very sharp transition from very slow velocity to very fast velocity. This is really consistent with uh, Previous work, uh, the thickening of the accreted oceanic crust uh, along this area. Another uh, um, very interesting feature that is not very um, obvious in the figure is the uh, lower right figure. Uh, Cannot point it very well to that. So we see some spotty uh, low velocity anomaly. Um, a long strike. This may relate to the accretionary uh, sediments of uh, the offshore basins. But uh, because currently we don't have station uh, offshore, uh, resolution is not that very good. Uh, but in the future, with the uh, uh, available of the uh, OBS, we will have uh, we will be able to improve the resolution. Another one is uh, we image the sub subducting slab very well. Um, what you see is from 70 to 150 kilometers. I plot the plate interface as reference uh, here for each uh, uh, slide steps. Um, what interesting for me is the slab is well imaged, but there is also the uh, heterogeneity uh, variation along strike. You can see at 70 kilometer beneath the central Oregon, the velocity is faster compared to the uh, northern and southern part. But when you move to the deeper depths, uh, the central uh, slab became weaker at the 
sorry for this, at the southern uh, part became really strong. Um, we are still need to do the uh, resolution test to see if this is uh, uh, very well resolved structure or this is uh, uh, some amplitude recovery from the method. Um, here I'm going to discuss the relationship of ETS segments with the seismic structures. Um, first look at the uh, right figure, uh, the white uh, uh, lines outline the recurrence intervals of three ETS segments. In the northern part is every 14 months, uh, in the central uh, part is every 18 months, to the southern part is every 10 months. So from the seismic image uh, at 15 kilometer, we see the central ETS zone correlates very well with the uh, second accreted oceanic crust. Uh, um, see the fast velocity anomaly here. If you move to 24 kilometer, um, where the ETS had occurred often in the uh, northern part at the southern part, we see uh, we see some correlation with the very low, low seismic velocity. Um, move to the upper mantle, uh, the uh, uh, ETS that has the longest uh, recurrence interval seems corresponds to the uh, weaker slab here. Um, now I'm going to introduce some implications from the seismic uh, velocity to the uh, hydration at a uh, melt. Um, we image very slow velocity back arc. Uh, it can be as slow as uh, 3.8 kilometer per second. From previous studies to explain the very low shear wave velocity at this depth, melt is uh, needed for that. Um, and there have been also uh, other numerical modelings to uh, explain why the back arc is very low. In this study, this suggests metal flow uh, is very important. Uh, and also by another uh, study, they propose a hydrous melting beneath the volcanic arc. So also another uh, correlation is the seismic low velocity correlates especially very well with the clustered volcanoes. So the question is how the melt in the back arc in the upper mantle is transported to the back arc in the uh, to the volcanic arc uh, in the uh, crust. Uh, this is uh, uh, showing that the slow velocity beneath the uh, volcanic arcs uh, in the crust. Uh, by previous studies, they uh, show the very low conductivity uh, in the volcanic centers uh, in Washington. Um, our seismic velocity uh, at this due to depth correlates with that very well. So this may also, if you see uh, the volcano centers in Oregon, you also see the low velocity anomaly beneath that. So this may suggest the existence of magma in the middle to lower crust. Um, to conclude, our 3D surface wave tomography model um, imaged the segmented upper plate at the subducting uh, slab. Uh, well, and also we show the cor uh, correlation of ETS segments with both the shallow and the deep seismic structures. Um, the very low velocity back arc, back arc requires existence of melt. And also moving to the crust, the volcano centered low velocity may suggest the existence of magma. But we need the mechanism to explain how magma is transported from uh, deep depths to the crustal depths. Thank you. We have time for a question or two. You got ready to do the 
the sum of everything. <laughs> all right. Well, well, thank you very much. Thank you all for, for coming to the session. This brings to a close the oral part of this. But remember, we have posters this afternoon, so bring a friend. And uh, we'll hope to see you then. Thanks again to all the authors. <laughs>